singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a brief review on iTunes or by simply becoming a patron via patreon.com or via interviewthefuture.com. Today, my guest on the show is Professor Massimo Piliucci. Massimo is one of those very rare and strange people who, I, if I have this right, he has three PhDs, one in genetics, one in evolutionary biology, and one of all things in philosophy. And he's also the author of 165 technical papers in both science and philosophy, as well as a number of books on Stoic philosophy, including the one that I just finished reading a couple of days ago called How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life. So, welcome to Singularity FM, Professor Piliucci. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. So today I invited you here to have a conversation with you about philosophy, ethics, technology, AI, transhumanism, and daily practice of how we can approach those challenges that we um, uh, all face in our lives. But let us start perhaps uh, at the beginning. Who is Massimo Piliucci? If you meet someone who's never met (laughs) you before in their life, and you're like in a bar drinking beer or something, and he says... Nice to meet you, Massimo. So tell me about you. Who are you? Who is Massimo Piliucci? What would you tell them? That's a good question. And I'm afraid that my answer would start with some variant of I'm a professor of philosophy. And the reason for that is because it has become a major part of my uh, identity. Uh, That's not unusual for academics in general. I mean, uh, but in my case, it's a little... uh, strange because as you pointed out I started out as a biologist and I thought of myself as a scientist for from from literally when I was a kid according to family lore to my grandmother I decided I announced that I was going to be a scientist when I was like five Uh, although initially apparently I was interested interested in astronomy not biology so so I thought always thought of myself as a scientist and as an academic and then uh, several years ago, in the middle of a sort of midlife crisis, <laughs> I decided to switch fields and, and go to philosophy. And um, I realized that this was definitely a good decision for me. Not that I regret anything that I've done in the sciences. I think my career in the sciences was great um, and very satisfactory. But, um, but philosophy really, at this stage in my life, really grabbed me. And so a philosopher, although it sounds like a little pretentious, is the way I would sort of introduce myself, um, even even in a bar. Um, but you know, and how and that's what's, gonna what's go the... with people that depends on what they think of philosophy. <laughs> exactly yeah. right, because my follow-up question here was, uh, have you done that? And what's the kind of response that you get usually once you say, well, I'm a professor in philosophy? <laughs> so I've done some variation of that. And yeah, typically because when people meet you, one of the first things that they do ask you anyway is, so what do you do? And, and, and oh, I'm, a, I'm a philosopher. Or, or sometimes if I want to soften the blow, I teach philosophy because that's, you know, it's a little bit less direct. Um, yeah, they don't really know what to say uh, because, um, first of all, most people don't have any idea of what a philosopher, professional philosopher actually does. You know? So I actually, in, in two or three cases, I've actually had people saying, so do you spend your time staring out into the void and thinking big thought, you know, deep thoughts? And I said, no, that's actually, I spend a lot of time on my word processor thinking about deep thoughts. But um, uh, so, so, and of course, I know for, from experience that a lot of people uh, inwardly think something on the lines of, well, that's a waste of time. <laughs> but they're all usually too polite to say so. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll come back to that, to, to that, but... Uh, and you already answered uh, the the question of whether you're first and foremost a scientist or a philosopher, because you do have two PhDs in science, genetics and evolutionary right. biology, and one in philosophy. So therefore, you should be two thirds scientist and only one third philosopher, at least by <laughs> academically speaking. 
<laughs> right. It doesn't, doesn't actually work that way. Uh, yeah, you're right. One would expect. I think of myself at this point as a full-time philosopher, although my specialty in philosophy is philosophy of science. So I do keep up with the scientific literature in my previous field, which was evolutionary biology, as you point out. So I, I typically think of myself as a combination of both. I mean, that was the point um, of uh, moving to philosophy. It wasn't to abandon science. It was to expand my view of science, look at, at science from the outside in a, in a sense. So, but, but then share with us, if, if you may, that sort of midwife, midlife crisis that, that you were facing that, that forced you to take that pretty radical change in your, in your life and, and even your outlook of life and the way you approach life, perhaps. And why is it that philosophy turned out to be sort of like a medicine for that midlife crisis and, and maybe even, as the philosophers say, a medicine for the soul in general? Why would that be right. the case, in your case particularly, but also in general? So th there were two aspects to my sort of crisis. It wasn't anything you know, particularly dramatic, but there were two aspects, one that most people probably can relate to and the other one that most academics can relate to. So the academic crisis was, okay, it, I did my standard uh, steps in the, an academic career, you know, assistant professor, full professor, uh, you know, associate professor and full professor with tenure, blah, blah, blah. I was doing well. My, my laboratory was funded by the National Science Foundation. But then at some point I stopped and I said, hmm, so do I really want to keep going and doing this for another 30 years? Um, and a lot of people, a lot of academics do ask themselves that question. The, what's, what's unusual in my case is the answer. Uh, most people say, oh, okay, well, let me retool myself. Let me spend a sabbatical learning some, something different. But they look at nearby fields. They don't look, you know, as far as philosophy, literally on the other side of campus, basically, uh, in, the, in the humanities, uh, you know, part of campus. In my case, that was the unusual part. And the reason for that is because I've always been interested in philosophy. And the reason for that is because in high school, when I was in Rome growing up, I had to take three years of philosophy. And my teacher was spectacular. I mean, she just, uh, you know, made the, made the field come, come alive. And so I always had an interest in philosophy. And so for me, it was kind of a natural, uh, natural transition. In terms of the, the, the personal aspect of the life crisis, again, this is something that most people probably uh, recognize. So I was in my early 40s. And in one particular year, year I was hit by sort of a triple, quadruple whammy. Um, Nothing, as I said, particularly unusual, but, you know, uh, my wife divorced me, my father died, I moved to a different city, got a new job. So each one of those four taken in isolation is enough to create a little bit of turmoil in anybody's life. All four of them happening within the span of a few months was a little heavy. That happened to be the time that I also had decided to go back to uh, get my PhD in philosophy. So I was studying philosophy. And, and so I figured, well, you're, you're in the middle of a crisis. You're studying philosophy. I think that you should try to, to, to see whether philosophy is going to be helpful uh, in, this, in this respect. Not academic philosophy, uh, but philosophy as a broader field, as a broader art of living in, in a sense. right? And, and sure enough, that's, that is where I found the answer. It, it, it took some time. Uh, the first thing that I uh, realized was that uh, whatever I was looking for in terms of uh, a new framework, a new way of orienting myself in life, was probably going to come from uh, an area called virtual ethics. Virtual ethics is, um, uh, is about uh, rebuilding your character, you improving your character and becoming a better, a better human being. And um, it is most famously associated with Aristotle's philosophy. So that's what I, what I did. I started with Aristotle. Aristotle didn't quite do it for me, however, because first of all, he's a little too theoretical and it doesn't actually give you any practical uh, you know, suggestions about how to live your life. It's, the, the theory sounds interesting, but, but there's not much of it uh, in, in the way of practice. And also, it's a little bit of an elitist. I mean, Aristotle says that the eudaimonic life, as the Greek called it, the, the life worth living, requires a focus on your character, you know, focus on what, what the Greeks call virtue, uh, or it's trans translated today as virtue, the word is arete, which actually means excellence. So becoming a better, you know, the most, the best human being you can. One um, of his daughters so, was also named arete, if I remember. Yeah, probably. Yeah, that's right. So, so you know, the focus is on virtue, but it's also Aristotle says, yeah, but you also need, 
you know, uh, a, bit, a bit of wealth and, uh, and you, you need education and you need health and you need good looks. And I said, okay, I'm screwed. There's, there's no, it's not gonna, <laughs> that's not going to happen. So it's a little bit elitist, um, which is not surprising since Aristotle himself was an aristocrat. He was, his father was a, a, the physician of the uh, king of Macedon, you know, so yeah. But it's interesting. It was interesting to go through the thing. And then the next stop was uh, Epicurus. Epicurus has got a lot of interesting things to say, including some practical suggestions about how to live your life. Um, the problem with Epicurus is that for Epicureans, the, the highest goal in life is to live a life not as much of pleasure, but without pain. In fact, Epicurus defined the highest pleasure possible as absence of pain, particularly mental pain. And so it's like, okay, um, and how do I do that? And Epicurus says, well, one thing you want to avoid is um, social and political involvement because <laughs> that's painful. And, you know, he's got a point. I mean, we, we can, you know, if you, if you just pay attention to the news, uh, in spite of particularly the political section of the news, it's like, yeah, this was right. But I couldn't imagine a life um, without a social and political involvement, a meaningful life without a political and social involvement. So the Epicurus was out. And so at that point, what happened was that uh, so I was looking and I was still saying, OK, well, it's got to be in this ballpark, more or less. And then I got this tweet of all things uh, that said, um, help us celebrate Stoic Week. And I thought, what the hell is Stoic Week and why would anybody want to celebrate the Stoics? Um, and then I realized, it's like, wait a minute, this Stoicism also is a type of virtue ethics. And of course, I had read Marcus Aurelius when I was in college. And in fact, in, uh, um, in high school, I even translated Seneca um, from Latin. But I never put the two together. I never actually sort of thought about these people actually belonging to the same general sort of philosophy. Uh, so I said, oh, let's, let's sign up. So I, I signed up for Stoic Week, which happens every year. Um, it's about to happen uh, in uh, this year. I think it's in October. And uh, basically what it is, is you download a bunch of, you know, material about the Stoics, the Stoics uh, you know, basic information about the history and philosophy of Stoicism. You start reading Stoic texts and then you start practicing. You that there's practical exercises that you go through. And at the end of the week, I thought that the whole thing really was clicking very well. So it was worth, you know, sticking with the practice for another couple of months. And then after that, I said, okay, this is actually really helping me out and I'm going to stick for another year. And then now here we are almost six years later, I'm still talking about it. And uh, by the way, I, I uh, want to recommend to all of our listeners and viewers today to check out Stoicon, uh, which is a fantastic uh, annual conference. And uh, you probably don't even remember, but we actually met a couple of years ago at the Stoicon conference here in Toronto. Canada. Ah, you did very briefly. <laughs> uh, yeah, you had a fantastic yeah. uh, presentation, and of course, many people came to talk to you and shake your hand. So uh, it's okay; you, you don't remember. But yes, I, I've with been these to... days, which we couldn't do these days, right? Um, well, so but hopefully, we'll be able to do it soon enough. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Well, I know. I just don't. I I know the stoic on this year, which is supposed to be in Toronto, uh, is actually going to go entirely online. Uh, it's going to be in October. Yeah. And then Stoic on 2021 is going to be physical, hopefully, in Toronto. Yeah. Right, right. And and so that may be another occasion for us to meet each other again in person. Right. Uh, but give us a little more about what's Stoicism and how is that distinguished from general philosophy? Because so people are very yeah. confused about what particularly Stoicism means. And, and, you know, we have this kind of popular uh, perception of it, which, as you often say in your presentation, is not actually what Stoicism is about. Right. Uh, the, the word Stoic with a little s in modern English uh, refers to somebody who, who tries to live their life with um, stiff upper lip and, uh, and suppressing emotions, which is, in fact, a distortion of the philosophy of Stoicism. As every distortion or stereotype, there is a grain of truth there. Maybe we're, we're going to get there, um, but it is a distortion. So Stoicism is a Greek and Roman philosophy. It originated around 300 BC in, uh, um, in Athens. And I often present it as kind of the Western equivalent of Buddhism, uh, because, in fact, the two philosophies have a lot in common in terms of ethics, in terms of how to behave 
in life. Their metaphysics are very different. Their view of the world is very different, but their ethics actually very is very uh, convergent. And basically the goal of a stoic life is to, as I said before, to become a better human being. And you do that by practicing a number of um, exercises regularly or and, and, and by being mindful, uh, the word, um, uh, the word that the Stoics use is prosoke, which means paying attention, basically. So by, by paying attention, by being mindful to, uh, what to, about what to do, you do every day in terms of the ethical balance of what you do, the ethical import of what you do. And there's a couple of ways of actually uh, doing this in practice. Uh, one of them, arguably the most important uh, or, or certainly most efficacious for, for people who just start practicing is the so-called dichotomy of control. The dichotomy of control goes back to Epictetus, who was a uh, late first century, early second century Stoic philosopher who um, greatly influenced the, the emperor Marcus Aurelius. And Epictetus uh, says at the beginning of the Enchiridion, which is his manual for a, for a good life, he says some things are up to you and other things are not up to you. And then he lists some things that actually are you control and other things you don't control. And then he tells you that the good life is made of focusing on the first bit and taking the rest as it comes, um, you know, developing an attitude of equanimity toward outcomes. Uh, in modern terms, modern terminology, that basically uh, corresponds to internalizing your goals. So for instance, if I were to go for a job interview tomorrow morning, uh, it comes natural to us to focus on the outcome, right? I want the job. I want the interview to go well and all that. But, but the outcome is not up to you, meaning that you can obviously influence it, right? The outcome does in part depend on how you actually do the interview, but ultimately this is not your decision. The buck doesn't stop with you. The buck stops with whoever is interviewing you, right? And it depends on other factors. It depends on who is doing the interview, what mood the person is when he's doing the interview, uh, what competition you have, from other people who don't know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you can do the best that you can, but ultimately the outcome is not up to you. However, the, the economy of control tells you, right, so focus on the bit that is up to you, and that is preparing the best you can, being focused in the interview, dress appropriately, uh, put together the best resume, et cetera, et cetera, and then prepare yourself mentally to say, look, I'm an adult. I understand that in life sometimes things go your way and sometimes they don't. And if they do, I'll appreciate the fact that in, in part, this is the result of my efforts, but in part, it's luck. It could have easily gone out the other way. And if they don't go my way, I'm not a child anymore. I'm not going to throw a tantrum. I, I'm going to pick up my, you know, I'm going to pick up my stuff and go for another interview next week or, or, or the week after. So that's the basic, that's the basic idea. I mean, there's obviously a lot more to be said about it, but that's the, the essential, essential part. One one of my favorite words that, that you use there while describing so stoicism is also, uh, for good or for bad, I think, unfortunately, a word that scares a lot of people. So I'd, I'd like you to describe or, or unpack that word for us too, and that's ethics. What is ethics? That's a great question. So if you, if you ask a modern moral philosopher, so you know, professionals who actually do ethics, essentially, uh, I'm going to use the word ethics and, mora and morality interchangeably. Some people make a distinction there. Yes. But in fact, the, in fact, the two words actually have a similar root. The word ethics comes from the Greek ethikos. And uh, the word morality comes from the Latin moralis, which is how Cicero translated the Greek ethikos. So the, originally, at least, they meant exactly the same thing. And so I'm not going to make a binding distinction there. I'm going to treat them the same. However, if, you, if you're talking about ethics or morality from a modern perspective, the emphasis is on whether an action is right or wrong. So an ethicist, uh, you know, if you write, for instance, to the New York Times uh, when they had the, their ethicist column, the question typically was, well, I'm about to do this. Do you think it's right or do you think it's wrong? Right. That's a typical, typical thing. And there are several frameworks uh, that are used by modern ethicists to answer that question. You could be a utilitarian and look at the maximizing, maximizing most people's happiness and minimizing people's pains, or you can be a deontologist and so following rules, uh, that sort of stuff. However, in the ancient world, the word ethics was understood far more broadly. Ethics literally was the study of how to live your life. Now, living your life implies that you're also going to try to make the right judgment and, and do the right thing, obviously. But that's only a part of it. 
it also includes, you know, what kind of acti activities should I pursue? What should be my goals in life? How should I treat people, uh, you know, in including my relatives, my friends, and so on and so forth. So ethics was far broader. And, and I really like the ancient conception of, of ethics for that reason. So for all effective purposes during this conversation, ethics means literally the study of, your, of how to live your life. Yeah, and I love how you define that, uh, which of course is no surprise to, to anyone who's been following me for the last 10 years because Socrates is my all-time most favorite guy. Right. <laughs> um, and of course, I was called Socrates when I was in the army, which was a, a sort of a nickname which I initially resisted for a while and then eventually I was like, well, if you can't fight it, you might as well accept it. Um, and besides, as far as nicknames go, that is a lot worse. <laughs> <in the> army. <laughs> That's a great point, especially in the army. That, that it goes a lot worse than Socrates, even though at the time that was derogatory, by the way. Yeah, uh, I, I can imagine. <laughs> so, but but still, there is a lot worse. Um, so, some of the the things or the the pushback that I get from people when I talk to them about ethics is one of the first things that they tell tell me is that. Ethics is totally subjective. What do you ah. tell people about that when someone says, well, you can have any rules that you want and you can come up with anything and, you know, you believe whatever you want to believe and there's not right and wrong and how can you right. tell me what's right and wrong if I believe that my right and wrong is different than your right and wrong and, yeah. you know, how do you yeah, address bunch that? Of, bunch of relativists. Uh, I noticed that a lot of my <laughs> students uh, also tend to answer that way, uh, that question. I think that those people are either lying or, or they're fooling themselves. More likely, they're fooling themselves. And the reason I'm saying that... Or it's that, the easy way out, I think. Yeah, it is an easy way out. But the reason I'm saying that they're fooling themselves or, or, or just being inconsistent is that when it comes to something that is done to them, they become outraged. So, so if somebody, somebody steals from them or somebody does, you know, uh, hurts them somehow, they immediately start saying, well, that's not right. Yes. The, well, wait a minute. I thought that uh, right and subjective, wrong was uh, right? subjective. So what are you talking about? Um, yeah, I, I think that a moral relative is, is simply an inconsistent person. is uh, is he's, he's confused about ethics and, and is inconsistent. By the way, a lot of my colleagues, a good number of my colleagues are relativists. But I, I'm not going to change. This may sound like a strong judgment, but I am absolutely convinced. I talked to a lot of relativists, including some professional philosophers who consider themselves relativists. And I find the position to be completely consistent. However, at the opposite end of that spectrum uh, is the another position that I also Sam find. Sam Harris, yeah, the scientists kind of like... Yes, the scientist yeah. or, or the, the, the person who says that somehow morality is not only objective, but mind independent. Kant was... Or quantifiable in some way or another. Quantifiable, but also the, the important thing here is, so these are called realists, as opposed to the ones that we were talking about before in philosophy are relativists. Yeah. The, the one I'm talking about now, Kant is, is the best example probably, are moral realists, meaning yeah. that they think that not only morality is objective, but, it is, but, but there are moral truths out there that, is, that we can discover, in a sense, right? We don't, we don't invent them. We don't invent morality. We don't construct morality. We just uh, we discover it. And you know, Kant was the, the most famous example. I mean, that's also pretty crazy, because uh, what do you mean out there? Uh, what do you mean that morality is mind independent? If there were no human beings, there would be no morality on Earth, at least. Um, so my position is intermediate, and it's the inter in fact I call it I call it quasi realism or more more. Uh, aptly probably, naturalism. It's a naturalistic ethics. And that is the approach that the Stoics um, have as well. And although I actually had developed, I moved toward a naturalistic approach to ethics even before I discovered Stoicism. So that, that was just a, a, a bonus once I figured out that, oh, the Stoics also are naturalists about, about ethics. And what does it mean to be naturalist about ethics? It means that obviously ethics is a historical human construct. It doesn't exist out there in any, in any meaningful sense. However, it is not an arbitrary construct. And the reason for that is because ethics, as I said, it's about living in a society, right? interacting with that world. In fact, the word ethicos that I mentioned earlier, from which the English term comes, literally meant originally interacting with others, community with others. right? So ethic, the point of ethics, in a sense, is to tell you how you should behave related to other human beings, right? Now, these relations, these interactions are not arbitrary because 
they, they are constrained by human biology. We are a species of social primates that evolved in a particular way. We are highly social. We're much more social than any other primate, arguably much more social than any other species on Earth, except for social insects. Um, but unlike social insects, we also have another little thing that is important. There's the ability to reason about things, to make decisions about things, which social insects don't. Um, that's why the Stoics uh, came up with this famous motto that kind of surprises people. And they said that they, we should live according to nature. And so when you hear the first time, it's like, what does that mean? Should I go strip myself naked and run into the forest and hug trees? No, you shouldn't. Well, maybe, maybe you should, but that's not what they meant. <clears throat> what they did mean was that we should live a life that takes into, into consideration, seriously, takes seriously what it means to be a human being. And for them, to be a human being means chiefly two things, high degree of sociality and the ability to reason about things, to solve problems by reasoning about it. So they, what they meant by their entire ethics is built on this notion that we should basically use our reason to improve social living, to improve relations with other yeah. people. Yeah, and you kind of preempted here my following question because it is kind of like the back bone or the, the, the cornerstone of that ethics. And that's the definition of being human. Can yeah. you perhaps reiterate that because it's crucially important because if someone denies your definition, then they're able perhaps to deny your ethics. Of course. And in fact, uh, some of the ancients themselves disagree with this story. So let, let me let, give, me, give you an example. Um, so first of all, let me back up for a second. As I said, it is a naturalistic philosophy because the ethics is grounded in human nature. But of course, there's a no number of things, number of aspects about human nature. There are other things that come natural to human beings, for instance, violence or xenophobia or anything like that. Those are natural uh, you know, attributes of, of humanity, unfortunately. And so, so one could say, well, why don't you focus on those uh, instead? And so, so why, don't, why don't you go around saying that we should be xenophobic and violent rather than reasonable and social? Right? And the Stoics' response to that is, it says that, look, Sure, those components are there, but we're not saying that everything that is natural is good because that would be a logical fallacy. That's called an appeal to nature. And the, the Stoics were very good logicians, so they knew better than, in, than, than engaging in a, logical, in a logical fallacy. I mean, it's pretty clear that we shouldn't do just whatever comes natural um, because there are lots of things that are natural and they're not good for you. I don't know, poisonous mushrooms come to mind, for instance. Uh, and there are all sorts of things that are not natural, and they're nevertheless good. Like, we, we're talking through, you know, I'm using a, an iPad here to talk to you, and that's a, certainly a non-natural thing. You don't find it in the middle of the forest, and yet it's useful. It's, it's something. So clearly they don't mean that whatever is natural is good uh, or, or vice versa. So what they mean is that in their mind, the most basic aspects, the most crucial, the most fundamental aspects of human nature are our ability to reason and our ability to, to live socially. Now, they made an argument for this. They didn't just state it. They made an argument. The argument is called the cradle argument. The cradle argument goes like this. If you observe human, human infants very carefully, you'll find that they, first of all, the first thing they do naturally, instinctively, without anybody having to teach them, is to look after themselves. They, they try to protect themselves, their bodily integrity. They're, you know, they're, they're trying to be safe for themselves. And then immediately, they realize, against, in, again, instinctively, they don't, they don't, without thinking about it, that in order to do that, they need to depend and be, and be um, paying attention to their caretakers. Okay? They are, in other words, they immediately expand their circle of concern to at least their parents and probably their siblings and things like that. And then if you follow human developmental psychology, a few years later, we hit the, the, the age of reason. That's about between seven to nine years old. That's when we begin to uh, be able to formula, formulate abstract concepts. And as soon as you do that, then you realize that, huh, wait a minute. If it's good for me to interact positively with other people in, in media surroundings, then it's probably good for me to do that with anybody uh, whenever, whenever possible, because we're, we're, we're cooperating in each other. In other words, a cooperation is far more conducive to my own flourishing uh, than conflict, than strife, and things like that. So that's the cradle argument. Now, as you pointed out, other philosophy might disagree. For instance, the Epicureans also used a cradle argument, and they said, 
Uh, well, as it turns out, the first thing you observe in, in human infants is that they seek pleasure and avoid pain, right? which, of course, is the foundation of uh, Epicurean philosophy. Now, the Stoics had a response to that, and they said, well, not exactly. Yes, they do. I mean, they, according to the Stoics also, seeking pleasure is, in fact, according to nature, and avoiding pain is also according to nature. That's for sure. Um, but they said that it's secondary because... Human infants clearly engage in behaviors that are not pleasurable and sometimes even painful if it is good for their well-being. For instance, they uh, struggle to very early on to, to, to uh, learn how to walk. And learning how to walk is painful because you, you, fall, you keep falling and you, know, you hurt yourself and things like that. And yet, nevertheless, they keep doing it. Right? So clearly, according to the Stoics, pleasure and pain are important, yes, but they're not fundamental. Uh, and so that's, that's the way these kinds of discussions go. You're absolutely right. Somebody could look at human nature and say, no, I have a different opinion about human nature. However, there is a little thing called science these days, which the <laughs> ancients didn't have, right? And I'm a biologist, as you pointed out, so I do pay attention to the science, uh, particularly to the interaction between science and philosophy. You mentioned Sam Harris, and one of my major disagreements with Harris is that he reads too much uh, into the science and too little into the philosophy. He doesn't seem, to, for instance, to realize that he actually starts his famous book, The Moral Landscape, starts out by assuming a particular philosophy, a particular moral philosophy, utilitarianism, without any justification whatsoever. So he actually gets the philosophy on board without even thinking about it, And on the one hand. And on the other hand, he seems that to, to say that you can straightforwardly read ethics from facts, and therefore that science is the, is the answer. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. As I just, I just showed you uh, with the disagreement between Epicureans and Stoics, you can't read things straight from the facts. You have to interpret the facts, you have to make certain choices, and there may be more than one reasonable way to look at the same exact facts from an and ethical perspective. That's what makes ethics so much harder, in my opinion, than uh, science, Agreed. actually, because Agreed. it's not so easy to get uh, uh, straight, especially let alone quantifiable answers from, from the facts right. that have ethical implications. There's so much interpretation, there's so much goal uh, orientation, there's so much context that you need to import um, that, that ethics becomes, in my opinion, so much more tricky and, and complicated than, than Absolutely. science. Absolutely. Um, yeah, go ahead. So so the, the point, however, is that there is, there is a science that is relevant, so you don't, you don't ever want to do philosophy by ignoring the science, because that's a bad recipe for doing philosophy. So yeah. what I'm saying is, on the one hand, yes, Harris is wrong, I think, that you can replace philosophy with science, but on the other hand, some of my colleagues are also incorrect when they, think, when they say, oh, science is just about facts, we're doing something different. No, we're not. We, we are thinking about facts, so we do need to get the facts straight. And moral, uh, so, sorry, modern science clearly tells you that the Stoics, I think, were pretty close to a reasonable understanding uh, of human nature. Um, both studies in primate, comparative primatology and comparative anthropology confirm that, in fact, human beings are fundamentally pro-social. Yes, we also are, have a selfish aspect to, our, to ourselves. Yes, we also have violence, xenophobia, and a bunch of other things. But foundationally, we are social animals. Um, how do we know? Well, because we have pro-social instincts, just like other social primates. There are other social primates that are closely related to us, like the, the bonobos, chimpanzees, for instance, that seem to have this instinct for a behavior that a scientist would call pro-social and a philosopher would say is ethical. You know, they try to help each other, even when they're not, relati not relatives, but they're trying to help each other within the same you know, the social group. They're trying to uh, diffuse conflict when it when it arises, you know things like that. And we have the same instincts. We have the same basically prosocial instincts. And then what philosophy does is it builds on those instincts. Uh, those instincts evolved, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, if not millions of years ago. So they're good as a starting point. You know, when you have that gut feeling that something is unjust or something is just, those are that's your instinctual reaction. But your instinctual reaction is just not enough because we live in a society that's far more complicated than anything that has occurred in human history, where there are lots more variables at play. Uh, there are a lot more interactions with other people. And that is why your instincts are a good beginning, uh, you know, a good starting point, but they're not definitely not the end of it. You need to actually use your, your reason to 
uh, arrive at better and better solutions, which is exactly what the Stoics were saying. Use your mm-hmm. reason uh, uh-huh. to uh, improve social living. So, Massimo, we are past the half, halfway point, and I wanted to take this time. In fact, if I had the chance, I would have taken a little more time to sort of uh, lay out the groundwork, the foundational, uh, maybe epistemological foundation uh, of ethics before uh, we go into the second part of our conversation, which is how and if or how we can take that ethics and hopefully apply it to what you just called our very complicated and advanced uh, civilization, our very complicated and demanding life today in the 21st century, and if that's possible at all. Um, And of course, uh, all my audience already knows that I'm very pre-biased in that because my whole work for the last 10 years uh, has been summarized by the thesis that technology is not enough. Uh, that that we need something else, something more. And in my claim, uh, it's it's always been the case that that is ethics. Uh, now, let me ask you this. So let there's a few ways we can approach this, but let me ask you first this at the, at the macro picture. What, in your view, are the biggest issues that humanity is facing today? Oh, that is a great question. Um... Well, there are two or three that are obvious that come to mind, and I'm going to just list them in random order, not necessarily because one is sure. uh, more crucial than the other. Sure. Um, obviously, we're, we're dealing with the very likely, the very real possibility at this point of a uh, serious cl- cl- climate collapse over the next several decades. That would be an unprecedented kind of crisis in human history. So we, we need to deal with it. I know that some people keep still you know, putting their, their head in the sand about this, but the science in my mind is very clear and it has been clear for decades at this point. It's not like, you know, there was a time where it wasn't clear. There was a time when it was reasonable to be skeptical and open-minded about these kind of things, but right now, that time is long past. And You know, I as an interesting side note, I was reading that there was a woman from New York State who in 1857, actually, she was studying in a college in New York State, and in 1857, she did a conceptual uh, first theoretical and then an experimental proof of global warming. And she wow. did like a sphere with a couple of gases and, and yeah, how, yeah. you know, uh, under certain condition, you have uh, a, a global warming effect. First of all, they refused to publish her paper because she was a woman. Of course. Secondly, <laughs> after many years and many tries, they did publish her paper. They refused her the, the chance to actually present her paper to a bunch of scientists like a few years later to a few meetings. So yeah. I was shocked to discover that the first ex- at least theoretical or experimental uh, proof that we could be facing global warming one day comes from like second half of the 19th century, like 1860s right. or 70s. Right. Right. So the running was on the wall. And at this point, if you don't see it, you're just blind, uh, either because of ideological reasons or because of ignorance, but you're just blind. So that's one challenge. Um, the second one, I think that we, we um, the second challenge that we're facing is to find out somehow a better way to get along with each other. Uh, the 20th century, as you know, was characterized by not one, but two world wars. Uh, we Fortunately, we haven't had another one since, but we have had a number of conflicts, either hot conflicts or cold conflicts. And that is something that's got to go, because as the Stoics recognized already 2,300 years ago, um, this, we live in a cosmopolis. We live in a world that is inter- highly interconnected. It was highly interconnected at the time, let alone now that we live in the you know, age of globalization, fast travel and things like that. And the pandemic is to show you just how interconnected it is. Right? This virus, the pandemic, is, 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 is occurring in part because it is so damn easy for people to get around uh, on this planet, which is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, I love traveling and all that sort of stuff, but it does come with these kinds of consequences. So I think that some better way of, of uh, you know, uh, coordinating things, efforts, and some better, you know, more, more cooperative uh, at the global level uh, effort to improve things and to make the world a better place needs to be articulated. Now, we tried, of course, a couple of things after World War I, particularly after the two world wars. After World War I, there was the League of Nations, which was uh, you know, originated by the Americans, by the American president at the time. And uh, Woodrow Wilson. 
Right. And uh, that failed. And one of the reasons it failed is because Wilson, understandably perhaps, uh, wanted to keep the, the club limited to democracies. And of course, especially at the time, that excluded like two thirds of the world. So you're not going to have a, a league of nations that is going to be particularly effective if you just you know, ignore two thirds of the world. After World War II, of course, we have the United Nations. And the United Nations has actually worked. I know that they have a you know, mixed reputation, and deservedly so. But it has actually worked toward uh, exactly that goal, toward reducing conflict to be helpful uh, across, across the globe. There the are... specific goal of the United Nations from the get-go was not to create heaven on earth, but it was right. to avoid hell, the nuclear Armageddon that we were exactly. scared of, of happening between the two superpowers of the world. Exactly. And so with respect to its actual goal, it has succeeded very well of diffusing attentions. And yes, we got very close a couple of times, yep. but, but with the help of the United Nations, we have been able to avoid that. So in that sense, it's been very successful. We haven't had a nuclear war, That's despite right. and, all its problems. That's right. And it has done a lot of humanitarian work and a lot of you know, diplomatic work uh, that wouldn't be possible without the United Nations. Now, of course, as we all know, the United Nations also has structural problems. For instance, there is the most obvious of, of which is that there is a permanent security council. That means that a small number of nations that just happen to be the ones that won World War II are basically in charge of everything. Uh, and, you know, that's the not... Veto that's powers. Not, yeah, with the power. That's not a sustainable model. And in fact, I, I would argue that a lot of the problems that the UN has run into are exactly the result of that particular structure. Now, I'm not, I don't know what the next stage is going to be, but I do think we need a, a next stage. It could simply be a reformed United Nations that work in some kind of different way, or it could be a completely different organization. I have no idea. But I do think that in terms of challenges, that is, you know, international cooperation is a challenge. The third challenge that I think we need to keep in mind is this, that we live in the um, in an unprecedented, almost unprecedented age of inequality in the world. Uh, it's true, as people like Steven Pinker keep saying, that things have gotten better and better. Yes, they, they, that's correct. I mean, just do the following thought experiment, right? You know, if you had a choice of any other place or time uh, to live in, on, on Earth or during the history of humanity, what, should, what would you choose? I would probably choose a Western country or some Eastern countries in the 21st century like Japan, for instance, or Korea. That's it. I mean, I wouldn't go back to the Middle Ages. I certainly, I wouldn't go back even to the Renaissance or to the Roman Empire or anything like that because they were pretty damn hard places to, uh, and time to live. So it is certainly true that we made progress. At the same time, we're also facing unprecedented challenges like the ones that I, that I just uh, mentioned. And it is certainly the case that the degree of inequality and uh, in, in this moment, especially not only among Western societies, actually, is actually at the same level as the one that, that we had during the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was the most unequal society in the history of humanity. I mean, it had slavery, so it couldn't, you know. Um, so I think that is something to deal with. And because it's not that, I'm, I'm not particularly concerned with inequality per se. I think actually uh, I follow a modern philosopher uh, on this, John Rawls, who argued that a certain degree of inequality is not only inevitable, but it's actually probably good. Um, because but then you have do... to have the veil of ignorance. Right. You have to have the, the, fam the famous veil of ignorance. Well, that's, the, that's which means you want to build a society uh, where, where, where there is no in built in privilege for anybody, that you don't know whether you're going to get the privilege. The, the, the One cuts and the now. other chooses. That's right, exactly. Um, so the, some degree of inequality, I think I agree with Rawls, is uh, not only inevitable, but actually structurally good, but not the level we have now. The level that we have now means that our political system is corrupt because for all effective purposes, especially here in the United States, our politicians are basically in the pockets, by and large, of large corporations and of billionaires. That's not acceptable. That's not a democracy. Um, we also have a situation where we live in the, you know, the richest country, one of the richest countries in the world, and one of the most technological countries in the world, and yet we can't find masks, uh, you know, cheap masks in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we can't find ventilators to help people when they get to the hospital. That, that's just not acceptable. Um, we have a system where uh, healthcare is tied to the place of employment, which means that in a situation like this, where a lot of millions of people are losing their job, they're also, on top of that, uh, losing their health care. And of course, they, there is no safety net. So it's like, it's a disaster. I mean, the, the pandemics, if anything, has uh, 
clearly put the spotlight on what are structural problems, not just leadership problems. Because there's, you know, we can criticize the president all we want, and I certainly do. Um, but it's not like if, uh, you know, I was just reading an article the other day uh, by somebody who pointed out correctly that it's not like if magically we could replace Trump with Biden or even Obama or whatever, that all of a sudden things will go well. Some things will go well, for sure. Obama did nothing, honestly, like well, nothing. Well, at least he did for, put, for, put in place... Um, maybe he the, didn't do so much damage and destroy the reputation right. and didn't do stupid sh uh, stuff like telling people right. to inject, uh, you yes. know, bleach or, or disinfectant exactly. or something. But exactly. he did nothing really, like, substantial. No, it's, I, I, I agree. He did little of, of substance. And so if, if somebody better, much better even, we're in charge now. Yes, there will be some advantages, as you pointed out. They wouldn't be giving random uh, and, and possibly lethal medical advice to people and things like that. Um, but the structural problems will still be there. We still would have millions of people without a safety net, without health insurance, and so on and so forth. And nobody can solve this by magic. This requires some kind of structural uh, rethinking of, of the foundations of our society. So I think these are the major uh, uh, challenges we're facing in. Uh, in international cooperation, inequality, and climate change. Mm -hmm. You know, when I go to speak uh, 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 around the world, I, I sometimes give one, one of the keynotes I give on is, uh, is called technology is the how, not the why or the what. Right. And I, I often talk about California, which is the golden state, uh, supposedly, and how uh, at least a quarter, maybe more than a quarter of, of the population there live at or below the poverty line. Uh, how uh, they have the, the largest conglomeration of uh, billionaire, now trillion dollar approaching companies in some cases, uh, private billionaires, uh, capital, uh, technology, uh, and educated people. And at the same time, if you compare California to uh, places such as Canada or the Nordic countries, which have less capital, less technology, uh, and less um, um uh, um, perhaps, uh, you know, amazing educational institutions such as Stanford and, and so on. Right. Uh, yet we still, for example, Canadians live almost four years longer than Americans on average. Mm -hmm. We have much mm -hmm. less crime. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, much more security, much more safety, uh, yeah. much fewer uh, 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 victims from COVID-19 currently, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So, so my point is that you see, you can have all the technology, all the money in the world, but if structurally it's not applied properly, you know, you would end up still having a society which is literally at the precipice of, of a collapse, it seems to me right I agree. now. I agree. I think that the, the way I often put something like the point that you're making is that uh, if we start counting from, let's say, the, the age, uh, the golden age of ancient Greece, so 24 centuries ago, Okay. Right. The, the age of Pericles. If we start yeah. counting from that point on, and, and the reason I'm suggesting that is because we have a good historical record. You know, if you go further back, then it becomes a little bit foggy what, what actually was happening. Yeah. But from that point on, we have had, of course, a enormous amount of technological progress and, and uh, increasing knowledge. Right? Knowledge and technology have increased, especially, of course, over the last two or 300 years. And wealth, too. Right, and wealth as a result of that. Yes. What has not increased at all, almost, is wisdom. Yeah, exactly. We have the same number, small number of people who keep telling us, you know, this is not a good idea, and most of us keep ignoring it because we lack wisdom. We actually suffer from a, from a condition that the Greeks had a word for. The word for it was amatia, A-M-A-T-H-I-A, -A -A, which literally means unwisdom. Yeah. And there's this beautiful um, dialogue, platonic dialogue, called the uh, Major Alcibiades, where Socrates is talking to his friend, uh, student, and apparently also lover, uh, Alcibiades. Platonic lover, not physical lover, platonic lover. That we lover. know of, right. Although it was not, not unusual at all not to go platonic in that case. Yeah, but, but, but they're talking about how their shoulders were burning when they rubbed shoulders with each other, so they actually <laughs> never consumed it, and Alcibiades pushed Socrates on multiple occasions and was denied, and he was very That's pissed right. off about that. That's right. It was so one it's, it's way. important to say that it was one way, and it oh, well, Socrates said he loves him too, but he never responded to his advances. So it was platonic. 
Right, but the, the important point here is yeah. that we're, we're having this conversation uh, in the Platonic dialogue between Socrates, his mentor, basically, Socrates, yeah. and Alcibiades. Yeah. Now, Alcibiades, uh, some of, at least some of some your listeners probably know, but he was eventually he became uh, a major a general in, in, in Athens. He played a major role in the Peloponnesian War, and it was a disastrous role. He was the one that um, convinced Athens, for instance, or, or pushed for Athens to invade Sicily, uh, which was turned out to be the turning point of, of the war against the Athenians, and, and it was a disaster. On, on top of which, uh, he was incredibly flamboyant kind of character. Um, he was an Athenian general, then uh, he, he defected to Sparta, and then he defected to the Persians, and then he went back to the Athenians. It's just like a mess. It's a really interesting uh, figure. Now, the dialogue between Socrates and Alcibiades at some point reaches this point where, where Alcibiades is clearly asking Socrates for guidance. Okay? Um, he's a young Alcibiades. He wants, he's, he's already a brushed young man, but he's, he's still asking for guidance. And, and, and Socrates says, you know, here's the problem with people like you. And by that, he means people that are interested in politics, people that want to go into politics. He says, the problem is you, are, you have enthusiasm, you have energy, but you lack wisdom and you're going to cause a lot of trouble for a lot of, a lot of people. The situation has not changed at all. As far as I can tell in the intervening 23, 24 centuries, we still have essentially the same thing. Um, when uh, I'm actually writing a book now in the middle of writing a book on the relationship between Socrates and Alcibiades. And uh, as part of the background for that book, I am reading uh, from beginning to end, uh, rereading the uh, Thucydides history of the Peloponnesian War. Yeah. And one of the amazing things about that book is that Thucydides reports mm -hmm. several people, including himself, but several people who had warned the Athenians of where the thing was going. Thucydides himself was actually an Athenian general before he yeah. was kicked out. Right? Yeah. Um, but then he says, you know, I did, I warned my, my colleagues and fellow citizens. Um, the playwrights did this well. There were several playwrights alive at the time, Aristophanes, for instance, and Euripides. Um, they all warned uh, of where this thing was going. Some of the philosophers, including Socrates, warned where this thing was going. Did people listen? No. And we have exactly the same situation today. So we have, a, we, we, we have this bizarre uh, situation where wisdom is accessible, obviously, because some people, at any particular age, in any particular time, some people actually can understand. They have the wisdom to understand where things are going and to warn the rest of us that we shouldn't go that way. Unfortunately, however, the rest of us are much more enamored of knowledge and technology and all that sort of that stuff and not wisdom. And therefore, we ignore to our own pedal uh, what these people are telling us. Yeah, I forget what poet was it that said that human nature has not much changed for the past 10,000 years than right. let's say the beaks of eagles uh yes. so so we have basically stayed at that level uh but uh, and and actually that's why i often say that uh you know we don't have things like climate change nuclear war uh or what else have you uh as a differentiating things but rather they're all one and the same thing and that is simply our technological power or prowess all uh, far surpassing our wisdom of applying yes. it uh, in a, in a productive, safe, uh, and 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 um, wise way, if you will, but, right. but basically we're kind of giving it sort of almost free reign, and 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 right. um, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I tend to be skeptical of what I call techno optimists. I have a friend who is a techno optimist. So basically, these are people who think that the, the solution to our problems, of course, will come from technology. Well, I certainly, I'm a scientist. I certainly don't discard technology. In fact, I'm an early adopter usually of technology. I just told you I'm talking to you through an iPad Pro and all that sort of stuff, right? So it's not that I'm against technology. I'm not a Luddite or anything like that. But I tend to be skeptical precisely because of what you just said, that there is a disconnect between the technology, technological advance and advancement and, and wisdom. And we tend to forget, you know, people who are techno-optimists tend to forget that technology itself is what created the problem in the first place. Like, you know, climate change wouldn't exist if we didn't have the, the, the Industrial Revolution. That was a technological advancement. Wonderful in a number of different ways. But nevertheless, when not accompanied by wisdom, here's, here we are. You know, only 150 years after, less than 150 years after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, here we are, we're destroying the planet. 
that's pretty damn fast. You know, that's pretty damn efficient, right? Um, so, well, so people would say the industrial revolution was more like 1670s with the the watt engine and stuff like that starting. Sure. But even th- those so. are just details. Yeah. Yeah, 150, so. 250, it, yeah. it doesn't right. matter. But we're getting here to the crux of our conversation. And unfortunately, I'm kind of getting a little stressed that we're running out of time. And this is where <laughs> the interesting part of the conversation actually begins. But unfortunately, we had to lay out all this foundation to even get to the meat of the matter yep. here. And because you see some of the most famous techno solutionists or techno optimists right now are people such as Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis and so on and so on. So Peter, right. for example, famously told us that we're going to live in a world of abundance and the future is better than we think. And Ray Kurzweil has told us that the singularity is near. So right. let me shift our conversation here to the meat of the matter and ask you, what's your take on the technological singularity? I don't think it's going to happen. Um, and and certainly it's not going to happen within the time frame that Kurt Swell is talking about. You you might notice that those these both of the people that you're talking about, uh, if you ask them, well, when is this going to happen? It's usually three or four decades down the road, which is just enough for them to be dead and, and not be caught into into oh hey it turned out you were wrong. Um, in fact, these kind of prophecies, to me, technological prophecies, to me actually bear a strong resemblance to religious prophecies. Um, there's, um, uh, you know, the, the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, which, of course, is a sort of evangelical fundamentalist religion, not religious sect, right? They used to be in the business of predicting the end of the world, specifically, as in, you know, this year is going to be the end of the world, right? They did that several times. Over After the last multiple and times, they changed their tune. They stopped. <laughs> they say, okay, well, it's going to come. It's coming soon, but now we're not going to tell you anymore, you know, when that's going to happen. Um, now, I'm being partly facetious, but, but the point is serious. Um, for one thing, and this would take probably a whole different conversation, maybe for another time, I actually think that Kurzweil uh, oh, underestimates a fundamental problem in terms of uh, singularity, especially when we're talking about an, one aspect of the singularity, which is supposed to be, or one response to singularity, which is supposed to be mind uploading. So like the way we're o- overcoming this is by uploading our minds to computers. I don't think that's going to happen. And the reason I don't think that's going to happen is because minds are the result of physical activities of a very particular kind. But the computer analogy between the consciousness and, uh, and, and, the, and the computer is, in fact, misleading. And several people now have been pointing out that this, this, this analogy has led a lot of research down at a rabbit hole without making that much progress. It's certainly true that there are computational aspects to what the human mind does. It also depends on how you define computation, for one thing, because you can, you can define computation broadly enough that basically everything becomes computational. But then at that point, the word kind of loses, loses meaning. So you um, think that the mind uh, is strata-dependent then? Yes, I think that the mind is substrate dependent. Now, that doesn't mean that there's only one possible substrate that can support consciousness. Oh, by the way, often we talk about artificial intelligence, but often people actually mean interchangeably artificial intelligence and artificial consciousness. They are not at all the same thing. Computers are already very intelligent, depending on how you define intelligence. If intelligence, you mean the ability to retrieve to uh, a large amount of data, to process large amount of data, to solve problems in specific domains and all that sort of stuff, then computers are already very intelligent and they will keep going in that direction. I don't see any sign of com- computer consciousness, however, at the moment. I am not suggesting that it's impossible because, first of all, because that's usually a bad bet. Whenever somebody says this is impossible, then it's going to happen the following day and you can look like a fool. One um, of Arthur C. Clarke's laws. Exactly. Um, well, one of my favorite examples, actually, is an astronomer, I forgot his name, but an astronomer who in 1957, the date is important, uh, confidently declared that human beings would never be able to put an artificial satellite uh, in orbit around Earth. Two months later, Sputnik goes up. So like, that's, that's a classic example of somebody yeah. saying, oh, it's never going to happen. And, then, and there's so, hundreds of those examples. Exactly. So, so I do think, you know, I'm not a, a, a mystic. I do think that consciousness is grounded in physical reality. And so as such, yes, we might be able to build artificial consciousness at some point or another. The question is, what are the, requ- the prerequisites? And human consciousness is clearly uh, connected to the wetware of the brain. It's a result of evolution. And it's not just a 
bunch of information information processing. There's a lot of stuff going on there. There's a lot of specific chemical interactions that have to go on in order for us to be to be conscious. Is it replicable in an artificial object? Of course, in principle, yes. Uh, is it going to happen with happen with silicon? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Uh, what I'm saying is that I'm very skeptical of people that are so confident that that obviously it's going to happen. Incidentally, when people talk about silicon and, and, the, and its chemical properties, I'm reminded of a, an argument that was made all the way back by Carl Sagan, one of my favorite favorite role models in science. He he did explore uh, from the point of view of exobiology the possibility that we might encounter silicon based. Uh, life and he was very skeptical of it and the reason for that is because he realized you know he knew, he knew enough chemistry he realized that carbon is very unusual the ability of carbon to create complex structures and interact with a number of elements is in fact unmatched in the entire periodic table silicon comes closest but the chemical flexibility of silicon is far reduced compared to to carbon. So when people so confidently say, oh, of course, we can do a carbon, you know, nature did it with carbon, we can do a silicon, I say, we'll slow down. The, 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 this is not at all a foregone conclusion. Well, but that's an argument of saying it's highly improbable, but it's not conclusive that it's impossible, right? So you're saying carbon right. is much more probable than silicon, therefore the chances of silicon are much less, but that doesn't mean there's zero. No, it doesn't mean that there's zero. Um, although, that doesn't mean if, I don't have currently an argument to show that it is impossible, but it's very it's very possible, so to speak, that yeah. that at some point we might realize that oh yeah, as it turns out, silicon is just too uh, restricted in terms of flexibility, and it's not going to happen. What I'm saying is, I see a lot of people, smart people, including you know Chris Watt, who are so damn confident that this thing is not only going to happen, but it's going to happen very soon. Then I'm going to say, whoa, slow down. You really have no reason to be that confident. Um, particularly because the main well, he has you know, a very very famous graph with exponential right. growth right. on it going from the 1890s the first right. uh, you know uh, census in the United States going through vacuum tubes yeah. microprocessors etc and uh, you but know. there are two major arguments against that graph um, one is of course he, what he's doing is extrapolating a curve based on past experience any statistician will tell you that's an incredibly dangerous thing to do because you have no guarantee that the curve is going to keep going that way. I can show you, for instance, in biology, we are experiencing right now. We are, we are in the middle of a pandemic. The virus has been growing exponentially, right? For sure, now, yeah. we all knew, however, that at some point, the exponential growth was going to stop. It had to. No matter what we did, you know, hopefully it's going to stop earlier because of social distancing and all the measures we're taking. But at some point, it had to stop. For the simple reason that the number of victims is limited, it's 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 finite. So it would go into what is called a sigmoidal curve, which is well studied in biology. We we, we know that's exactly what happens with bacterial infections, viral infections, and so on, and so forth, or even any kind of population growth. At some point, you hit what is what biology is called the carrying capacity of the environment, and that's it. it the, the 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 curve flattens, and then eventually, in fact, it, it crashes. Criswell or nobody else has any idea of how that curve is going to continue. That's one possible extrapolation, but it makes a large number of assumptions about what's going to happen in the future. Also, back to the point that I made a few minutes ago, that curve is about computational ability, not consciousness. Consciousness doesn't come anywhere in that curve. We don't have a, core, a curve for consciousness uh, because you know it would have to be a biological curve and we don't, we don't have it. And it's measured in millions of years, not, not in... In, in decades. So for all those reasons, I tend to be fairly skeptical, either that this thing is going to happen, period, but certainly that it's going to happen any, any anytime soon. And one of the things that worries me, I mean, you know, to some extent, this is disagreement without consequence. It's like, okay, well, we'll see. Um, but there are some consequences because, and practical consequences, because there are some people actually, who, including Kurzweil, who are suggesting that this is a major problem that we should invest a lot of resources into this thing. And if it turns out to be a known problem because it's not going to happen or it's not going to happen in the time frame that they're talking about, then, you know, resources are limited. Whatever we take away from something uh, to go to divert to, to an, a new problem, uh, uh, it's, going, it's going to have practical effects. There was a reason why when you asked me, what do you think are the major challenges that we're facing in the near future? As you noted, singularity this wasn't one of those um, yeah. because I'm not, I'm seriously not worried that that's going to be a problem. 
uh, if I were to put a fourth one to the three that um, I, I already mentioned, I would say some kind of extraterrestrial impact from a wandering asteroid. That is more likely in my mind than a singularity. Again, uh, that doesn't mean that computers are not going to get smarter and smarter depending on how you define exactly you define intelligence. They definitely will. Um, but even there, there will probably be a, a physical limit. I mean, after all, you know, micro, as you know, microprocessors are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but there is a limit there. It's imposed by they matter They say itself. we're getting to the five nanometer scale now, and then the Heisenberg uncertainty principle right. kicks in, but, but then the idea is we're going to move to a new paradigm. So instead of silicon, we're going to have three-dimensional or, you know, quantum sure. computers or what have you. Uh, sure. And then that's Ray Kurzweil's argument of a whole sequence of S-curves of paradigms changes rather than a single curve. Right. But if you notice what you just did, not you, but what Kurzweil just did was n now, if you're saying, look, we're going to hit a limit and then some kind of paradigm shift happens, then, first of all, those are just words. We don't know what kind of paradigm shift, if any, is going to happen. But now... You cannot extrapolate from that curve anymore because the paradigm shift means that now you're in a completely different kind of dynamic. You cannot just keep going on the same curve. The, the underlying process is now different. Mm -hmm. um, so, we'll, you know, we'll see. Uh, I, I, I might, obviously, I might be wrong, but uh, I think there's some reason for uh, cautious uh, skepticism about these kind of things. Yeah, and, and, and I get that. And I think uh, your second argument actually is much better than the first argument, uh, if you ask me. But... Uh, let me ask you, because we're really running out of time and we're just diving into the meat of the matter here. So <laughs> what is, where does transhumanism fit in? Or no, actually, before that, I wanted to ask you about teleology because, and that's actually a very uh, interesting point because you're an evolutionary biologist. So I want to get yeah. your take. You know, Ray has this six epochs of the singularity where you start with sort of uh, physics and chemistry, then you go through biology, then you go through minds, then you go through technology, then you have the fifth one is the merger of technology and biology. And the sixth epoch is where he says the universe wakes up. So you have this, what I would call teleological, and those are mine words, not his right. words, a teleological yes. movement from less to more intelligence. So you're an evolutionary biologist. Like, right. what's your analysis of that? Because that's kind of your ex area of expertise. It's is it nice. fair for me to call it a teleological? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Uh, I think that's nice science fiction and not, not much else, quite <laughs> frankly. Um, so if there's one thing that, that science has demonstrated or has argued strongly over the last 300 years is that there is no teleology in the universe. The universe doesn't have an end point, an omega point. It doesn't have a trajectory of any, of any, of any kind. Things just happen as a result of physical laws, as a result of, of you know, physical, chemi chemical, and biological processes. Uh, one of my favorite biologists of all time is, was Stephen Jay Gould. And Gould wrote an entire book on this issue of complexi complexity, right? Of the, the evolution of complexity. And Gould, uh, Gould's argument was very simple and I think very, very convincing. He says, look, people often say, oh, there must be a reason why, you know, uh, biological evolution over the last several billion years in, has led to increasing complexity. More and more complex. And then you, you, can, you can pick any arbitrary number of points on that on that branching pattern, because that we have to remember the evolution is not a sequence, obviously, it's, it's a branching, it's an incredibly complex branching pattern. But you can pick any, any number of points on this branching pattern and, and draw a nice line that shows that things have gone in a particular way. But Gould's argument was like, well, what else did you expect? Life had to start simple. It couldn't possibly start complex, because if it started complex, then it would be the result, uh, a strong indication of intelligent design. Yeah. It had to start at the simplest possible level, the simplest possible cells, the smallest number of proteins, the smallest uh, DNA, et cetera, et cetera. And so from there, where are you going to go? It's only going to get more complex. But it's going to get more complex because of competition, because the simple life forms are going to be a disadvantage as soon as some level, higher level of complexity, more efficient, functional, uh, functionally, is going to evolve. So this notion that there is a teleological sort of uh, aspect to nature, I would think that would have gone down the drain. This was a very Aristotelian, of course. Aristotle was uh, very much into teleology. But I would have thought that that would have, was sort of put to rest with the scientific revolution of the you know, 17th and 18th centuries, and certainly with Darwin. Uh, but apparently, it just keeps coming back for some reason. So I, I don't think there is a, um, there is a, there's much foundation to that. Also, 
again, people just throw words that I'm not sure as a philosopher, the philosopher in me can, it kicks in. You know, philosophy uh, is very much about being careful about the words that you use, right? And so when Kurzweil says things like, and the universe wakes up, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> I mean, it what? means we're going to have smart dust and everything from right. Matryoshka brains and computroniums and right. you know smart dust that everything is smart there's no dumb matter anymore left and i have no idea what that means i mean i understand the words <laughs> but i have no idea what that means as, yeah. as <laughs> okay so so and one other part of here of the teleology uh, sort of uh, and i think actually uh, aristotle coined the term teleology if i'm right yes but, that's right but uh, one other subset of, of that kind of uh, singularitarian uh, take on teleology, which it's unrecognized perhaps within our community, is also transhumanism and how itself it's a sort of a teleological uh, ideology or idea or, or movement, if yeah. you will, because it kind of presumes that, again, there's this movement from uh, less to more intelligence, which we go through, you know, uh, animal kingdom, then humanity, and then sort of transhumanity as right. the next step. So human is a step on evolution, and then transhuman is obviously, come right. on, the next step of evolution. What do you think of that? You're an evolutionary biologist again. Uh, falls into the same. First of all, as you know, the, actually, people mean different things by the word transhumanist. So, so it depends. I mean, we're talking about technological improvements. Are we talking about biological evolution? Because we're now close to be able to alter our own genome. So, so we could actually. Yeah, potentially we're talking break. about humanity being getting in charge of its own evolutionary right. destiny. Right. Whether with genetic engineering uh, or, or, you know, whether with, you know, mind uploading or what have you, where right. we become in charge of evolution by design, if you will, by our own intelligent design rather Correct. than randomness. Correct. So, uh, so then there are two responses there from, from my perspective. One is, well, that's yet another example of teleology. There is no guarantee going anywhere. Uh, that could be a potential future, of course. Um, because it's logically consistent, so it's a potential future. Or we may go extinct you know, in the next 10, e 10 years because we're going to finally cause some kind of major collapse and then we're done with it. No, no trans anything. In fact, no human anything. So uh, again, if, if somebody's saying, well, that's a possible trajectory for humanity, sure. If somebody on the other People hand... People even say it's inevitable. Right. That's the part that I'm going to reject. There's nothing inevitable about that sort of stuff. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I'm teaching a course this semester on science fiction and philosophy. And one of the chapters we're going to read next is the doomsday argument. And the doomsday argument basically argues that no, no, uh, that there's fairly re reasonable, you know, uh, philosophical arguments to suggest that no technological civilization would ever, in fact, uh, last that long. Because if it had, then we would have actually seen it because we would have, uh, you know, gal galaxy-wide expansion of that civilization. So this is, this is an argument for the notion that at the some Fermi point... The Fermi paradox. Yes, the Fermi paradox. At some point, technological civilizations are far more likely to actually go extinct than to go to the next level. So, so I argue... So in other, what I'm saying is, on the one hand, if you're telling me, if somebody's saying, you know, this is a possible future, yes. If, on the other hand, they're arguing this is an inevitable, inevitable future, no, because that's yet another case of teleology, which I don't think is supported by, by, by the science. It's another example of scala nature, as it was called in Latin during the Middle Ages, right? But this notion that bacteria and viruses are at the bottom and human beings are at the top, and then above the human beings is only God, right? And then we're striving toward that sort of situation. Well, a virus is just reminding us of how just how vulnerable we are, despite all our technology and all our, you know, pride in, in our intelligence and stuff like that. All it takes is a few proteins and a bit of RNA to cause it literally a worldwide shutdown and, you know, millions of people infected. So it's like, you know, let's slow down here for a minute. So that's one thing. That's one response to the uh, transhumanist scenario. The other response is, well, do we want to go that way? Even, even if we can Right, that just because we can, that doesn't mean that we should. Um, one of my favorite shows uh, until recently was The Big Bang Theory, and <laughs> there is a there is a book uh, called the philosophy the, the philosophy of the Big Bang Theory to which I contributed a chapter, and the chapter that I contributed to was about scientism. So this this notion that you know whatever science does is good uh, in, inherently, right? And it's the best way to do, to go about it. And my chapter starts with a 
really interesting episode where um, you know the, the four geeky guys basically of the of the group are are in their apartment um, doing the, the following thing. They they've connected their the light switch in their apartment to via the internet to China. And then there's this guy in China who pushes a button and turns on and off the lights of their apartment, right? So Penny, who is the non-scientist and yet grounded in sort of common sense uh, character, comes in, says what they're, what they're doing, and, and she says, okay, but why? Why, why are you doing this? And the, the four guys in unison, uh, resp- in unison respond, because we can, right? That's for them, that's the only motivation. That is lack of wisdom, the kind of lack of wisdom we're talking, we were talking about earlier. No, you don't do things just because you can. You ask yourself, if you can do things, then you ask yourself, yes, but is this a good idea? Is this, is this a good thing, thing to do? And actually, right? this brings me very well to the, the best de- or one of the best definitions of ethics, which is having the power of doing something, but knowing whether you should or you shouldn't actually do that thing. That's where ethics right. comes, so, in my opinion. Exactly. Exactly. So, as you know, there are different um, uh, sort of types of, of science fiction stories. There are those that are optimistic about the future, like the original Star Trek, for instance, right? Uh, Gene yeah. Roddenberry was yeah. a humanist, uh, and he was you know, very optimistic about, about the future. And, and then there are the dystopians, uh, like Philip K. Dick, for instance, right? No, no story by Philip K. Dick ends up ends well. <laughs> for, for, and, and they're all about you know the disastrous effects of essentially lack of wisdom that we're talking about, right? And I tend to be a little bit more on the dystopian side of things. Again, I completely agree that technology has brought wonderful things to us, and I take full advantage of those things. But I am worried about when some people, especially people with large egos and a lot of money, are saying, begin to say things like, oh, we can alter our own DNA and take evolution in our own hands. I can see so many ways in which this could go really bad, really wrong, that I am seriously worried. Also, there are, as you pointed out, ethical issues here. Other than the potential lack of wisdom of the people who might be in charge of these kind of efforts, well, Precisely, who should be in charge of this of this thing? You know, who should be making these decisions? If we're talking about, uh, you know, literally altering the, the 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 future course of human evolution, should we actually leave this kind of decision to some scientists, to some technolo- technologist, to, to some entrepreneur? Why? What, what about the rest of us? I mean, there is there's you know six billion people on the planet. Why why is it that this discussion should be going on at those at those levels? Those are literally, uh, you know changing the future of humanity and it seems like um anything of that that magnitude ought to be discussed very seriously and and pursued very carefully and if there is one thing that one attribute of Kurzweil that doesn't strike me as the right one is that he's not a cautious person he's, he's not a, he's, he's he's throws himself into those kind of things which is typical of technologists and typical of scientists to some extent and inventors. And they inventors, embrace right. the proactionary rather than precautionary principle. And that's Correct. a very well-established and well-embraced uh, principle yeah. within the transhumanist community. Yeah. Now, Massimo, that has been sort of like the, the point of my work for the last 10 years, at least since I started my podcast, trying to bring ethics within this conversation and, and go back to, to sort of, if you will, dive into the ancient wisdom of the Greeks and the Romans and see how we can apply that to our everyday life. Now, unfortunately, I feel like I've abused your time here today and I've taken (laughs) so much of it, but I'm really enjoying it. So I'm just going to ask you the last two questions so that we can wrap it up. And hopefully this will be the the first of several conversations, perhaps. Uh, So what is the best place for people to find more about you and your work? Uh, the best couple of places are uh, my comprehensive website, which is massimopilucci.com. Uh, you'll find there everything, all the new essays or links to new books and podcasts and videos and all that sort of stuff. It's all there, it's including a lot of freely available, downloadable material. And then on Twitter at uh, mpilucci, M-P-I-G-L-I-U-C-C-I. 
Mm -hmm. Very well. So, Massimo, uh, we discussed one hour. I've kept you a lot longer than that. Thank you very much for this. But if you were to send us away with a single most important message that we should take away from this maybe 70-minute conversation with you today, what would you like that to be? That we should accompany our science and technology with a good dose of philosophy. And that's a message that I can only embrace. So, <laughs> Professor Massimo Piliucci, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation.